ಅನಿರ್ವರ್ಣಾಪದಂ ವಾಕ್ಯಮಿತ್ಯಾಸ್ಪದುಷ್ಟಯ ಸೂಷ್ಮೇದೆ ವಾಗ್ದೇವಿ ತಾಸ್ಮಹೆ ಎಲೆಕ್ಟ್ರಾನಿಕ್ ಮೀಡಿಯಾ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಧ್ಯಪ್ರದೇಶ ಪೌಜ್ ಓಪನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ಸ್ its audio program eternal values of indian culture friends in the eminent scholars lecture series today we are going to present the lecture of a great scholar of our country professor tri bikrampati he was a former vice chancellor of Allahabad University and Sri Jagannath Sanskrit Vishwavidyalaya Puri Today we are going to present his lecture on the topic eternal values of Indian culture all know the distinction between civilization and culture civilization pertains to the external aspects of the achievements and living of human beings and culture pertains to something deeper more profound it is intrinsic and it depends on certain fundamental values certain norms certain basic beliefs these values are called in sanskrit purusharthas purusha the word purusha means man but purusha here does not mean just man purusha here means a developed evolved and cultured man that is a human being who has attained a certain level of excellence purushartha is therefore etymologically the norm set for the development of a cultivated man for the evolution of man to the highest stage of self realization according to our traditions which are very ancient the highest purpose of human life the summum bonum is moksha that is salvation but salvation does not mean getting rid of life salvation is not a negative concept it is a positive concept it means the evolution of the personality to such an extent that the baser instincts are sublimated the lower aspects of life are transcended and man comes nearer to god the divine in man becomes manifest so moksha is truly getting rid of the bondages of life the various shackles which bind man moksha is freedom freedom from bondages so it is a state of being in which all boundaries are broken all limitations are transcended it is a highly evolved and sublime state of being it is not only a mental state it is psychosomatic mental as well as physical but intrinsically it is spiritual because it goes beyond the mind 
and the body. Intrinsically, man is a spiritual being. Man is just not a rational animal. As the Greek philosopher once upon a time had said, man was defined as a rational animal, but that is a poor definition of man. Man is the divine in a process of evolution. So our Purusharthas, which are four in category, in number, Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha culminate in Moksha. Moksha is the ultimate objective, but the other values are nearer home. Kama is the fundamental one, but it comes at the third place. In the categorization, Dharma, Artha and Kama, this is the order. Kama comes at the third stage, but truly it is an intrinsic value because it is something which is basic for the existence of man, the desire to be, the desire to love, the desire to extend oneself, the desire to transcend one's limitations, that is fundamental. And very aptly Lord Krishna has said to Arjuna, Dharma virodho bhuteshu kamosmi bharata shabha. O Arjuna, I am that desire which is in consonance with and in harmony with dharma. But what is dharma? Dharma is not a religion. It is a collection of norms. What we call in jurisprudence groom norms. That is the ground norms. The basic norms the fundamental principles, the ethical principles on the basis of which human life can be sustained and evolved. As Albert Schweitzer, the great Western thinker, very aptly said, without an ethical content, human life becomes a desert. It becomes empty. It becomes vapid. It becomes uncreative. Therefore, for any development, for any cultural evolution, it is fundamentally the ethical values that are needed. Basically, the ethical principles that are needed. The ethical principles must govern our life. That is the principles which will lead to good life. The principles according to which we distinguish between that which is good intrinsically and that which is only apparently good, only pleasant and so apparently good. Shreyascha, Preyascha, Manusya Metastau Samparitya Vibhinakti Dhiraha. These words of the Vedic times remind us of the distinction between that which is really good and that which is apparently good. Something can be very pleasant but may not be genuinely good. Whereas something which is not pleasant may be genuinely good. We must know how to distinguish between these two. Dharma is that body of principles according to which we can make this distinction. And therefore, dharma should not be looked upon as professed religion. Our tradition goes beyond prophets. We do not believe in a last prophet or a prophet or a number of prophets whose sayings and whose teachings are final. We have kept man free from the influence even of prophets. There is therefore a kind of freedom in the Indian attitude towards life which makes religion subsidiary to what we call dharma. Religion is largely professed on the basis of the teachings of some prophet like Christianity, Mohammedanism, Buddhism and so on. But the Indian attitude 
which is manifest in the concept of dharma transcends religions it goes beyond and it conceives of a free inquiring mind which rises slowly but steadily towards a higher and a yet higher plane of existence this is very beautifully exemplified in the course of our cultural history indian culture has been respected throughout the world for this fundamental contribution that ethical values are given the highest importance and religion is not considered something which must be binding upon an individual an indian may profess no religion and yet may be completely dharmic now artha has been placed in the second stage but truly kama comes first in terms of the basic nature of man and artha comes immediately next why because artha means the equipment the wherewithal the requirements the paraphernalia the infrastructure on the basis of which kama can be fulfilled how can we fulfill our desires when our desires are for the betterment of man yet we cannot fulfill those desires in thin air we have to go to certain basic infrastructural requirements and take care that those requirements are fulfilled that is the concept of artha and artha therefore is not an intrinsic value it is an instrumental value that is to say it is a value which becomes instrumental in the attainment of moksha which is the ultimate objective of human life kama is the very source of all activity desire without that human existence is impossible but desire to be fulfilled requires artha artha is thus a fundamental value but then artha which is needed for the fulfillment of kama should not be such as to be in disharmony with dharma dharma is the guiding principle it creates the fundamental basic norms on the basis of which kama and artha should be guided and with the guidance of dharma it is possible to attain moksha this has been very nicely discussed in very many aspects of our classical literature particularly the vedic literature and the literature of the upanishads the upanishads which are also called the vedanta give great emphasis on freedom of thought there is a wonderful story in the upanishad the story of nachiketa nachiketa is a young man who has been given as an offering to yamaraj by his father nachiketa objected to old cows being given as sacrifice by his father and so his father took offense and then he gave nachiketa as sacrifice to yamaraj nachiketa goes and waits for yamaraj yamaraj takes some time to come back and then he meets nachiketa and asks him as to what he wants nachiketa says that he wants three boons to be granted to him the first is that he should be reconciled to his father the second that he should become well versed in yajnagni vidya he should know the secrets of the sciences of his times the third is a more fundamental boon that he wants yamaraja to grant to him and that is 
He wants to know the secret of human life, the purpose of human life. After all, this life in the mundane world is limited. Everyone who is born is sure to die. Then what is the purpose of human life? Is it only a casual existence to be spent somehow, a duration of time which is to be filled up somehow? Or is it that man has a definite purpose, a calling, a certain objective, a certain ultimate purpose? This question has been raised by Nachiketa. Then Yamaraj says, Nachiketa, why are you bothered about such metaphysical questions? Don't worry about these ultimate problems. They will trouble you unnecessarily. Then he attracts Nachiketa towards the pleasures of this world. He says, Ye ye kama durlabha martya loke Sarman kamang shandata prartha yaswa Ima rama sarotha saturya Nahi drisha lambhaniya manushyai Whatever desires are very difficult to attain You can get fulfilled through my boon I can grant you all the pleasures of this world which are very difficult for human beings to get. O Nachiketa, look at these beautiful girls. Take them with you. Enjoy their company. There will be musical accompaniment and there will be a ratha also that will carry you. Be comfortable. Enjoy life. Why are you bothered about these ultimate questions? But Nachiketa is not satisfied. He has a questioning mind. He has the spirit of free inquiry. He is the evolved person who wants to go beyond the common experiences and probe into the mysteries of life. So he replies beautifully in immortal words. Navittena tarpani yo manushyo Lapsya mahe bitta madraksma chetva Jeevishyamo yavadi shishya sitvam Varastume varani asta eva I want that particular vara, that particular boon and nothing else. Man is not satisfied by pleasures of the body. Bitta here means pleasures of the flesh, pleasures of the body. The physical pleasures, the so-called pleasures of the world, they are not going to fulfill my desire, my quest for eternal truth, for the ultimate and the fundamental truth. So let me inform you, O Yamaraj, I will insist on your granting to me the boon by which I will know the secret of life. And let us now, at this stage of civilization, ask ourselves, how many human beings think about the purpose of human life? Most of us live life mechanically. Most of us live life by imitation. We observe those who are our seniors, those who are in high and laudable positions, and we imitate them. We rarely reflect within ourselves on the purpose of human life. But life is precious. Life is glorious. And each one of us has therefore a basic duty that is to live this life as fully as meaningfully as possible. So we ought to ponder as to what the purpose of human life is. Our ancient saints and seers had fixed their attention on moksha, on freedom from bondages. 
Indeed, no philosophy can be loftier. No thought can be more sublime than the thought that man's ultimate destiny is freedom from bondage. Bondage that is based on selfishness. We are mostly governed by our egos. We don't go beyond our own selfish designs. We generally remain circumscribed by those designs. Our activities are mostly selfish and we rarely attain anything like a stage of self-realization. But as soon as we look around, think of other human beings and feel that we are one with them, that their sorrows and sufferings are as much our sorrows and sufferings. When we feel a bond of unity among human beings, we transcend our narrow and individual selves. We go beyond. It is this that has been expressed very beautifully in the Sanskrit verse. Yatha bhavijji vitam atmana priyam Tatha paresham api jivitam priyam Nirikshate jivitam atmano yatha Tatha paresham api raksha jivitam Just as our lives are dear to us So also others' lives are dear to them Just as we are fond of the preservation of our life Our own individual lives so also, we must take care that we enhance the lives of others. We beautify the lives of others. We enrich the lives of others. We live for others. Live and let live. We must adopt this wider standpoint. That actually will be the basis on which gradually we shall ascend from the level of common human beings to the level of the self-realized soul, one who has a vision of moksha. I think for this lecture, the Purushartha concept will give you sufficient food for thought and you will think about the purpose of human life in your own ways. There is no definite guideline you think in your own way. Everyone is free to think, free to meditate. Atma va are, rashtavya, srotavya, mantavya, nididhyasitavya. In the Brahadarandaka Upanishad, these wonderful words come from Yajnavalkya. The great saint Yajnavalkya says, the Atman must be realized, but there are different stages through which it can be realized. The self can be realized through observation, drashtavya shrotavya, by observing, seeing, hearing, and then mantavya must be meditated upon. We must cogitate, we must think, we must meditate and know what after all the Atman is about. And then finally, it is nididhyasitavya, that means we cannot stop only at the level of introspection, speculation, thinking, meditation, which is of course a higher stage than observation. We have to go beyond. We have to realize what we have meditated upon in our day-to-day -day life. In other words, we should not only be armchair philosophers, but we should carry the great philosophy of the principle of good life, the great philosophy of self-sacrifice that is the fundamental principle of good life to our own lives. We must carry the high principles which we have meditated upon to our day-to-day -day existence, our day-to-day -day activities. It is only when we guide our own activities 
by the high principles of dharma that we will be able to realize ourselves and that will be the prelude to moksha in fact most people think that in this age of science dharma has no place in human life because science is our guide science is our master science will show us the path what is the use of those classical ideas of ethics of dharma but you will fully appreciate that science tells us only about how phenomena occur and how various happenings take place science can never answer the question why why do phenomena occur in this particular manner this why remains unanswered it is only through introspection through intuitive appreciation of human values that man can answer the question as to why life should be led in a particular way and not why in another manner why one particular attitude is superior to another attitude why cosmopolitan attitude is better than a parochial attitude why universal brotherhood is superior to selfishness these questions can be answered only through an understanding of value through an understanding of dharma and through an understanding of the ultimate objective of human life that is moksha so we should not think that because we have entered the age of science truly i accept we are in the age of science but we should not think that dharma has become irrelevant rather you can see after the explosion of the atomic bombs on nagasaki and hiroshima what a crisis has been created in human faith man does not now trust science scientists and technologists who can be governed by dangerous military powers can bring about destruction of mankind so we must be careful how can mankind progress how can there be a preservation of human life in the best possible manner and how can there be a constant progress constant evolution of man both mental moral that is spiritual it is possible only through an appreciation of the ultimate values the purusharta and the appreciation of the great significance of self realization truly it is very interesting that self realization is possible only when the self is forgotten and the wider self is invited and embraced when my individual self merges in the self of the whole universe in the paramatma only then i really get self realization man can never get self realization by being selfish only by avoiding selfishness by transcending selfishness by going beyond his self he can attain self realization listening to an audio program eternal values of indian culture subject expert was professor tri bikrampati sound editor piyush kamble anchor danish usma qureshi program was directed and recorded by Amar Bahadur Yadav and produced by Electronic Media Production and Research Center of Madhya Pradesh Bhuj Open University